Hello everyone. In this video, we're going to be finding the inverse of a function. At least we're going to make an attempt. f of x equals x times ln x. And we're going to try to find the inverse function, which is f inverse of x. The negative one here is not the power. It just indicates the inverse. So it's not the reciprocal because that will be super easy, right? So. How do we find the inverse of a function? We're going to talk about some general method and then we'll apply it towards the end. But before that, let's go ahead and take a look at something else. Let's do some calculus, shall we? Why are we doing it? the calculus part? I'll, I'll let you know a little bit. So let's go ahead and take this function f of x equals x ln x. Oh, by the way, I'm also going to show you a graph at the end. And let's go ahead and differentiate it. How do you find f prime? If you know a little bit of uh, rules for derivatives or rules of differentiation, you should know the product rule, which tells you the derivative of the first function times the second function, plus you do the same thing for the second function, so on and so forth. So the derivative of x is 1 times ln x, plus the derivative of ln x, which is 1 over x, something that you should memorize, multiply by the first function. When you simplify this, you get something like ln x plus 1. A lot of times we're going to write it as 1 plus ln x because it's less confusing. Make sure that 1 is not logged. Okay? Sometimes you can kind of write it like this, but it's always better to write it as 1 plus ln x. And from here, obviously, we want to set the derivative equal to 0 to find the critical points. And this gives us ln x equals negative 1, which implies x equals e to the power negative 1. And that is equal to 1 over e, the reciprocal of e. So at x equals 1 over e, we have a critical point. And notice that x needs to be positive because of the domain of the natural log function. Of course, we're looking for real values here, even though complex values may well be defined. Or are they well defined? I don't know. Anyways, let's go ahead and make a table using this critical point. And almost always I make the same type of table, so you should be familiar. Our rows are x, f prime, and f. And then we put the critical value of x here, which is 1 over e, and put a little 0, meaning that 1 over e makes the derivative 0. Okay? And then we're going to put the sign, so plus minus signs, depending on where the derivative becomes positive or negative, right? How can you tell? Well, you can pick a value that you can test, like something greater than 1 over e, maybe like 1. If x is 1, the derivative is going to be positive because ln 1 is going to be 0. It's going to be 1. So then we can safely say that, hey, derivative is positive here and negative here, which indicates, and by the way, this is important, you can go from the derivative of the first, the sign of the first derivative, you can basically go from that to whether the function is increasing or decreasing. In other words, if the first derivative is minus or negative, our function will be decreasing, and otherwise it's going to be increasing, which means we have a minimum at 1 over e. Now let's go ahead and find the y value for that critical point. In other words, f of 1 over e is going to be 1 over e times ln 1 over e. Remember the function was x ln x, and ln 1 over e is e to the ln e to the power of negative 1, which is negative 1, multiplied by 1 over e, it's just going to be negative 1 over e. So we have a minimum, to be more accurate, at 1 over e, comma, negative 1 over e. That's a point whose y-coordinate is negative, which means the minimum point is going to be below the x-axis. And that's going to come up again. Let me show you how. If you replace x with 1, f of 1 will be 0 because of the ln function. Remember, our function is x ln x. When you replace x with 0, I mean 1, f of 1 will be 0. Now, here's the thing. And x must be positive. You know that, right? Cool. So, if x is less than 1, then ln x is going to be less than 0. You probably know that, right? And we also know that x is greater than 0. So, x ln x is going to be less than 0. But x ln x is just f of x, which means f of x is less than 0. What's that supposed to mean? It means that if x is less than 1, then f of x is less than 0. If x is greater than 1, then f of x is greater than 0. I'm not talking about the derivative. I'm talking about the actual function f of x itself. Make sense? So what's that supposed to mean? Well, we got a minimum point. So our function is going to be decrease and then increase, making a minimum. Uh-oh it's not going to have a single inverse. 
because it doesn't pass the horizontal line test, which means it's not one-to-one -one or it's not injective. Injective is just a fancy word for one-to-one, -one, which means you can find two output values. I mean, the other way around. You can use two input values for the same output. Make sense? Okay, under these conditions, we're not gonna have a unique inverse, but that's okay. We can just pretend that it exists and then at the end, we'll make up for that, okay? Real quick, at least theoretically. So let's start with this. I'm trying to find the inverse of a function. Remember, I told you that I was gonna talk about the general method. So here's the general method. First, you need to replace f of x with y. And then you wanna put the x term on the left. It doesn't have to be that way, but I just like it that way. So your goal is to solve for x, okay? Solve for x, because basically the idea is the following. If f of x is equal to y and you switch x and y, you basically find f inverse of y, which is gonna be equal to x. So by solving for x, you are finding f inverse of y, and then you can change the variable. Make sense? So let's go ahead and solve for x, but solving for x is not very straightforward, unless you take advantage of a very, important function, a very special function. What is that called? Lambert's W, of course. What else can it be, right? Today is Lambert day. So now let's go ahead and write the x as e to the power ln x, and y is gonna stay the same. And then we're gonna go ahead and Lambert both sides, put a big W on both sides, and then we're gonna get the following. When you apply W, Lambert's W, on something like t e to the t, the output will be t. In other words, it's the inverse function for t e to the t. So when you apply it to something like this, you're gonna get ln x. That's gonna be your output, and that's equal to w of y. Remember, our goal is to solve for x first. So let's go ahead and do e to the power of both sides, e to the power of this, e to the power of that, and e to the ln x is actually x, so x becomes e to the power w of y, and this is equal to f inverse of y, remember? We talked about it at the beginning. If you switch them around, you get f of x equals y. Make sense? So far, so good. Now, once we got f inverse of y, obviously, you don't want to express it in terms of y. You want to express it in terms of x. But you're like, how come you just change y with x? It was different. It doesn't matter. We can just discard it and start fresh. f inverse of x is just going to be e to the power w of x. Now, but didn't we just say that this function is not going to have a unique inverse? Yes, because Lambert's W function has different branches. In the real world, it has two branches, and you kind of get a cutoff point, so on and so forth. But you use the appropriate branch for whatever domain it's given on. And this brings us to the end of this video. Well, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. Please let me know. Don't forget to comment, like, and subscribe. I'll see you next time with another video. Until then, be safe, take care, and bye-bye.